Just for running late and running out of pizza, but there is pizza in there again now. Of course, you're going to be in here, and I'm going to go eat the pizza. But, so, but here's Tommy Mitchell. Thank you. <laughs> now, you can't blame me. I didn't have any of the pizza, so you're okay. When we, when we go out and do these conferences, so often what we do is we deal with things that the world throws at us. You know, the age of the earth, the dating methods. What about human and chimp DNA? What about distant starlight? All these kind of, and that's very important. I'm not saying it's not. We deal with issues that the world throws at us. But in this session, we're going to talk about the ark and the flood. And in so many ways, this is a little bit of a different kind of issue. It's a different kind of problem. Because when we talk about Noah's ark particularly, I'm really not sure that the problem is out there. I think the problem may be somewhere else. Is this Noah's Ark? Is this Noah's Ark? No. Yes, it is. The reason you can tell, the giraffes are sticking out the top. No giraffes, it's not the Ark. The variety of animals on the deck, optional. The woodpecker, optional. Whether Noah's got a butterfly net or a staff or a stick or a baseball bat, optional. No giraffes, it ain't the ark. Now, is this Noah's ark? You bet it is. The giraffes are sticking out the top. The monkey on the porthole is optional. Now that you've been taught, we're going to have a test. Tell me when you see Noah's ark. Is the one on the bottom Noah's Ark? No, the giraffes are not sticking out the chimney. They're just standing on the deck. You got to pay attention. You see Noah's Ark here? Actually, you don't, but the one in the middle is one of my all-time favorites. It's the Rub-A-Dub-Dub -dub three animals, the tub Noah's Ark. <laughs> now, the reason I like that one is the little pink submarine in my bathtub sinks that one every single time. I'm like 768 to nothing against that one. You drop the soap, it goes down. Now, there's something missing from the Rub-A-Dub-Dub three animals in the tub Noah's Ark. What, what's missing? Noah. It's the Rub-A-Dub-Dub three animals in the tub without Noah's Ark. Is the one on the top Noah's Ark? No, it's a rooster. It's not giraffes. You've got to know your animals. Nope, we still haven't seen Noah's Ark. Do you see Noah's Ark here? Actually, I think on the bottom, that is Noah's Ark. We have gotten a magnifying glass out at the ministry, had a serious debate on that, and we have enough people who are convinced, yes, we do think that's Noah's Ark. Did God have this in mind? Or that. <laughs> now, would anybody like to venture a guess where we got most of those Ark images? Children's curriculum and... Vacation Bible School curriculum. Not all. Most of those images came from the church. Folks, we have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Now, I'm going to share with you what the most frightening thing about creation ministry is. Tommy, will you do question and answers? Not a problem. Happy to. This is going to sting, folks. Adults, you ready? I am not afraid of you. I can stand up here before you, wave all my diplomas at you, give you a bunch of answers, got all kind of 12-syllable words in them, and you'll go home saying, that guy's pretty smart. You know what frightens me beyond measure? The question and answer session with the second graders. Anybody here tried to tap dance around a second grader lately? How'd that work out for you? They see through you like glass. Second graders are the most annoying creatures on the planet. <laughs> they ask the absolute most obnoxious questions. Why is the sky blue? Yeah, you're laughing. Why are the planets round? And the question I hate most of all. What does that mean? 
They are not at all impressed with my academic achievements. I'm just some fat guy talking to them about Noah's Ark. But when you show them a bathtub ark with a giraffe sticking out of it, they know it's a joke. They know it's a cartoon. They know it's a fable. And you know what you've just done? You've told them that cartoon's in this book. We've got a problem here. We've met the enemy, and it's us. i got a radical idea. We teach our kids about the ark. Why don't we do something really amazing? Let's teach them what God's Word says. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits, and the height of it, 30 cubits. Folks, ain't no giraffe going to stick out the top of that boat. Now, this is our current illustration or rendition of the ark. If you prefer still the boxy sort of, you know, squared off, you know, floating warehouse, got no problem with that. Do we know what the hull looked like? No, we know certain information, that's all God's Word tells us, and as long as you're consistent or you, you honor the Word, then I don't have a problem if you still like this particular model. Now, the reason that we use this whole illustration is, and people have tested these whole, whole models and things, a lot of ancient societies uh, had whole forms very similar to this people who were seagoing peoples or uh, the, the shipbuilding societies. And what we found is this model of the hull that's got the little skeg in the front and the vein in the back, when you've got winds and waves coming this way, you know what the boat does? It actually turns into the wind and the wave. That sort of floating warehouse, it kind of gets parallel to the wave. So when the wave gets there, sometimes, you know, like the top becomes the bottom and that's just not really like the way you want to do it. So it's not quite as stable, but as long as... You know, the illustration we use, as long as the boat we're talking about is to scriptural dimensions, I don't have a problem with it. Facts about Noah's Ark. 437 to 505 feet long, depending on which particular type, you know, version of the cubit that you want to use. 73 to 75 feet wide, 44 to 45 feet high. It's twice as long as the 747. It's a football field and a half long. It's a floating warehouse. This is not a toy boat with a giraffe sticking out the top. You know the ark had three decks, had three stories? Now, if you're Noah and his family, which deck you want to live on? The top? You're going to be going up and down all day long. Wouldn't it be better to live down there like below the animals? Below the hippopotamuses? No. I'm just, just a thought question. Genesis 6, 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. I can prove there were rooms in Noah's ark. Here's an actual photograph from Noah's ark. <laughs> hey, you're laughing so far. I'm about the only person in the world who hasn't claimed to have found it. But, you know, if you think about it, it really does make sense. You know, places, you know, farms and stables, places where they raise animals, you know, they have stalls and pens and different things to care for the animals. And, and to me, it's a, very, it's a very natural concept, very natural idea that there would have been rooms or stalls or pens in the ark. Now, in saying that, I'm going to ask a question. And I'm absolutely counting on somebody giving me the wrong answer. Now, if you're the person that gives me the wrong answer, first of all, you're not by any means the only person in this room who would ask that question. You were just the bravest one to ask it. And you have just joined a very non-exclusive club of about 100,000 other people. Now, this is the issue. It makes sense there would have been rooms or stalls or pens in the ark, right? Why? Why? That's the wrong answer. Thank you. I, there was one church a few months ago that I was really getting after about 20 seconds. Nobody said it. She said to keep the animals from fighting, to keep the animals meeting each other, right? That's not the right answer. Would the animals on the ark be eating each other? No. Why? That, well, not necessarily because I can prove that animals were eating each other before the flood. And I get to that. So you're on the right track. Huh? I'm sorry. They would still have eaten. You're, you're on the right track, but I, I would argue that they took small babies. 
Um, this is the reason. Genesis 1.30. What did the animals and man have to eat in the beginning? Plants. Adam and Eve and the animals were originally vegetarian. God's leading these animals to Noah. Is he going to lead animals that are violating his directive or animals that are still obeying the directive? Two of every kind of animal, seven of some. I would submit that the animals on the ark would not be eating each other. They would not be a danger to Noah and his family. Think about this. If the animals would have been eating each other, been a danger, who is Noah going to send to feed the T-Rex? I mean, his mother-in-law is not on the boat, okay? <laughs> So, so right away, you know, you know, go down, and if you don't come back, I'll explain it to your mom. I mean, if the animals on the ark would have been a danger, to, if they'd been eating each other, how many animals would have gotten off the ark? One. And it would have been, like, really fat, right? It didn't say, Noah, take two of every kind of animal, seven of some, and some sheep to feed the T-Rex. I would argue that the animals on the boat were maintaining what God said to do, plants only. Now, were animals before the flood eating each other? Prove it. I can. I'm going to. I want to see if you know the answer. I know you don't. I'm trying to bail you out here, brother. Work with me, okay? I love you. But, but there is a way to answer that question. Fossils. We've got fossils of creatures that have eaten each other. Or, you know, the one, got, you know, the one creature eats another, that kind of thing. But... We have evidence in the fossil record of creatures that have eaten other creatures or have eaten part of other creatures, and those creatures are found in what we would consider to be flood sediment, creatures that would have been trapped from the sediment of the flood. We're going to talk about the fossils a little bit more in a few minutes. Certainly there are places around the world where there's been fossilization after the flood. We're talking about creatures in flood sediment layers that obviously have eaten other creatures. So some animals were carnivorous before the flood, but I would argue the ones on board the ark would not have been a danger to one another. So why would there be rooms and stalls and pens? Well, different dietary requirements, ways to break uh, up the workload to caring for different animals at different times. Maybe it's easier to clean up after them in certain ways. Uh, certain of these animals may well have been hibernating during that time, so the other animals wouldn't have been disturbing them, you know, waking them up, you know, not threatening them necessarily. But it makes perfect sense. There may have even been some structural reasons. You know, the way you construct the rooms and things may have made the ark more, you know, sturdy on the inside to keep it from torquing a lot of different you know forces are going to be brought to bear on the boat uh during the during the flood this is the one of the models of the ark we have the creation museum now do we know it looked that way of course not but the thing is we have people that are engineers that have uh sort of had a lifelong fascination with you know construction techniques and things and we know certain structures in the past were, were, were built and designed in similar ways to this so this is possibly how it might have looked but we don't present this as absolute fact there are just different ways you can construct a wooden boat that that size that's very stable now when we think about the ark the first thing people think about are the animals and to be honest that's not what I think about the first thing I think about are those poor people I don't know about you, but after about the third day, the fun would have wore clean off that for me. You know, that would have been like adventure, camping for a couple of days. After that, there's no place to get off. You're there for the duration. Total volume of the vessel was 1,400,000 cubic feet, roughly the equivalent of 522 railroad boxcars. It's a floating warehouse. But what, by and large, do we show our kids? The overstuffed houseboat with a draft ticking out the top. Until 1884, the Ark was the biggest ship ever built. We don't have a reliable historical record before 1884 of a ship bigger than the Ark, but since that time, we've got ships that are many times the size of the Ark. In other words, do you see Noah's Ark here? The answer is no. It was one half the length of the Queen Mary, and they've actually done studies on models of hulls of many different kinds of ships and vessels, one to the proportion, you know, relative proportions of the ark, certainly not full size, but they've subjected these things to winds and waves and currents. And you know what the engineers have found? The ark was very stable. In other words, the ark could have adequately completed the voyage for which it was intended. Now, how did you already know that? How do you know that the ark was successful in the voyage for which it was intended? Because we're here. That's right. So you got up this morning, looked in the mirror, you saw somebody. This is really easy. But see, if, if I'm going to be in the worst storm, the worst cataclysm the world's ever seen, I don't want to be in a boat with a giraffe sticking out the top. 
It's not going to be very stable. And again, if you believe the flood was local, I really can't help you. Because in about three minutes, this bad boy's going down no matter what. Hey, Christian, how can you believe in this fairy tale about the ark? I've actually had college professors look at me and say, how could you believe that fairy tale about the ark? There's no way you can get millions of animals on a boat that size. That's just nonsense. How could you believe that? And again, what's our answer? We agree. We don't need millions of animals. The question is, how many do you need? Was it a pastor's conference? about three years ago, and I love to go to pastor's conferences because, see, I'm in church more than anybody I know. The problem is I hear the same guy every week, and I'm getting real tired of that guy too, okay? I hear myself all the time. I like to be in a place where I can get good preaching and sit under good preaching because my pastor's great because my wife and daughter are at church every week. He's always sending sermons home for me, and I put them on my iPod so I can at least have some good preaching to listen to. So I love being in church, but... That's why I like to go to pastor's conferences because I know for two or three days I'm just going to get preaching. So I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm ready to go. So I was at this conference a couple years ago, and I was the second person up on a Wednesday night, and I was going to be talking about how loving God could allow death and suffering. And this first guy was up there, and he was, he was my kind of guy. He was preaching the paint off the walls. He was just getting it. You know, our God's magnificent and wonderful and how powerful God was and all this. And it was just, he was just, you know, he was just all people talk about our God can't do this and our God's so wonderful. And about, you know, 10, 15 minutes before he's done, I'm, I'm sitting in the back. I'm tweaking my talk, and I'm kind of thinking, okay, I'm, I want to add this and I want to add that. And about that time, this guy says something like this. He said, well, you know, people just laugh and they mock at us about our God. Our God's so powerful. Our God can do anything he wants to. He said, like these people that mock us about the ark. These, people, these scientists said there's no way we get millions of animals on that boat. If God wanted millions of animals on that boat, he'd just put them on that boat, and that's just how gracious God is, and that's just what he did, and he did it. And I just went, uh-oh. In front of 350 pastors, he gave the worst possible answer. God just miraculously changed time and space, and these animals existed within each other's bodies or something because there's no way you can get many animals on the boat. So I said, Lord, you know, what am I going to do about this? You know, I need to address this question because obviously nobody knows the answer. So for the first and only time in my life, I did a talk about death and suffering, which is about a 48-minute talk that had 22 minutes about the ark in it. I have no idea how, I was in the back just, I mean, slides were flying everywhere, and I'm just thinking, I got to fix this, and I went up and did this talk, and afterwards, that same pastor came and said, Tommy, that was great, I didn't know there was an answer to that, and he was being sincere, he didn't, I mean, he's a great guy, I love the guy to death, but he said, I just didn't know there was an answer, so we sat down, a bunch of other guys came up, and we just sat there and talked for like two hours about it, there are answers, but see, the world says, Christian, when you don't have an answer, you just say, God did it, and that settles it. And that's not always the case. Sometimes God did tell us, you know, there's a miraculous uh, uh, action occur. Okay, that's fine. But when God didn't tell us that and we just said we don't understand it and God did it, that's not sufficient. So how many animals would you need? We would say at an absolute maximum, 16 to 18,000. Now, we know how we classify animals in our modern classification schemes today. The thing we don't know is the limits of what we call the original kinds of creatures. You know, God created living things, and they reproduce after their kind, right? Which means when cows reproduce, they have what? When turtles reproduce, they have what? When cats reproduce, they unfortunately have cats. See, this is not hard. But see, we don't know where the limits are, you know, this many you know, generations down the road. So if you take all these modern classification systems, and you just go to the level of family, that's where we get this 16 to 18,000 number. The actual numbers, we've continued to do our research on this about the ark, is probably going to be a, really closer to three or 4,000 maximum. But you don't need millions. You just need a few thousand. But how many kinds of dogs are there? I mean, Google it. You're going to get a different answer. I finally just got tired. I'd just say a whole bunch, you know, 17,500. I mean, how many different kinds of cows are there? How many kinds of cats are there? I know the answer to that. Too many, yeah. You know, if I'd been on the ark, there'd be no cats. That's free, by the way. But the thing is, how many dogs would have gotten off the ark? You say two. Okay. Those dogs are supposed to do what? Multiply. So they had offspring. Their offspring are what? Dogs. 
Okay, when those dogs reproduce, their offspring are what? Dogs. And when those dogs reproduce, their offspring are what? And this goes on and on and on, right? And pretty soon you have what? Lots of dogs. <laughs> Is this evolution? No, it's just what? Dogs. But all these dogs are not the same, are they? How does that happen? I'm going to tell you. How does it happen? It's a process called natural selection. <gasps> you can't say that. You believe in the Bible. That's real biology. You don't believe in real science. Actually, as Christians, we do. You know, natural selection was first described as a cogent concept by a creationist named Edward Blythe 30 years before Darwin. Darwin actually had this man's writings in his library. Natural selection's real. We see it in our world every day. What the world says, evolution by natural selection. You know, these small changes in animals, if you give it millions of years, is going to cause a dog to be something other than a dog. It doesn't work that way. So you got all these dogs. And they, a couple of them say, well, you know, it's getting kind of crowded around here. I think we need to move someplace that's not so crowded. So mom and daddy dog, they go north. Now, do they do better if they have, what, long fur or short fur? Long fur. What happens to have short fur? They get cold. A group of people, a group of people, a group of dogs say, well, you know, I don't like it. The car, I'm going to go south. They do better if they have long fur or short fur? Short fur. What happens to have long fur? <laughs> they get hot. They don't reproduce as well. What happens if a group of dogs go to the forest, heavily forested area? They do better if they have light colored fur or dark colored fur? What happens to have light colored fur? They get eaten. Think of a polar bear in the Smokies. This is not rocket science. <laughs> See, certain physical characteristics give creatures survival advantages in certain environments. You know, in the forest, you know, dark fur. In the Arctic, you know, bears that are white, polar bears do better than brown bears. This is not hard. So over many generations, as these creatures continue to live in these areas, those traits that are not desirable over time become less and less frequent in the gene pool, and those, those physical characteristics that are desirable get propagated. So all of a sudden, you get sorting the genetic material. That's how you start out with two dogs and get all the different varieties of dogs. But there is a limit to this. Because if evolution's true, and you go from simple creatures to complex, you have to gain or lose information. You have to gain, right, to go from a simple creature to a complex, because you've got to add more information. You know what's actually happening here in this process? You're losing information. You're losing variability. You have the same number of genes, the same total amount of genetic material, but you're losing certain characteristics, so you're actually losing information. And that's actually desirable. I mean, these, some of these situations, you know, the, the sorting the genetic material gives these creatures a survival benefit, but they're not getting more complex. And I can prove it. I can prove that dogs are not getting more complex. You know what my proof is? Poodles. That's the end. Poodles are the cul-de-sac of dogs. <laughs> Beyond, if poodles lose any information, they just cease to exist. <laughs> so, see, the process is not going this way. The process is going this way. So, you start off with two dogs. You get all the different varieties of dogs. Works the same way for cows, cats, turtles. But do you see a cow, cat, or a turtle turning into, into anything other than a cow, cat, or a turtle? See, natural selection is variation within the kind. Median size of the animals would be about the size of a rat. Only 10% of the animals would have been larger than a sheep. You know, most animals aren't very big. One railroad car holds 240 sheep, so the ark could hold 125,280 sheep. Using one-third of the ship's deck, deck surface, 40,000 animals can be housed. Question, is 18,000 less than 40,000? And remember, this is the worst-case scenario. And for this illustration, we're assuming all the animals were the size of sheep and only 10% would have been that large. More than enough room on one deck for all the animals required. Remaining ships area could be used for food, supplies, living area for Noah and his family. What else was there room for that did not get used? Room for more People. Somebody said waste. That's a great answer. But, and that's, and that's the number one question we get about the ark. How'd they get rid of the poop? 
We got an answer. It involves a whole lot of water. Okay? Now, where would they get a whole lot of water? Everywhere. See, this is not hard. But the thing is, there's room for more people. Noah's a preacher of righteousness. Don't you know for all those years he's building that boat, he said, you better be on board this boat. There's trouble coming. If this is an overstuffed houseboat and a giraffe's are already sticking out the top, they're going to be laughing at him. There's plenty of room on the boat. How many got on board? Eight. Eight people. What a tragedy. You want to really get laughed at? Here's a question for you. Were there dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? Yes. How did he get them on board? I mean, he butter their head and push? I mean, how do you get a sauropod through a door that size? And then even when they get on there, they're going to get bigger, right? Well, is there, in, actually some may well have. We can't be, based on how we, how we know certain reptiles grow in our world today, but, you know, I'm willing to be convinced. Is there any way we can absolutely answer this question? Yes, we can. There is an absolute answer. Where do we turn for that answer? It's right here. Well, the land animals made on day six. Yep. Are dinosaurs land animals? Yep. All of them are, by definition. The seagoing reptiles and the uh, flying reptiles now have their own classification. Dinosaurs today are classified as land reptiles. Of course, you know, back in my day, they, we kind of lumped them all together. But what did I know? Back in my day, Pluto was a planet. <laughs> and now Pluto's not, no longer a planet. Actually, I'm circulating a petition. Once you get to be a planet, you should always get to stay a planet. I think that's just wrong. Pluto's been very, been very much harmed, and I think should sue for mental anguish or whatever. <laughs> but nonetheless, back in my day, the seagoing and the flying reptiles were considered dinosaurs, but in our classification system now, land reptiles. Did Noah take two of every kind of land animal? Seven of some on the ark. Yeah. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah. Steve so just answered your question. How did dinosaurs reproduce? They laid eggs. Can we prove that? What do you find inside these eggs? Fossilized dinosaurs. We've got fossilized triceratops and fossilized T. rex eggs. How big is a T. rex egg? Anybody know? Actually, it's not. It's about, that's about right. Just, it's about the size of a football. So before you have a big stegosaurus, you have a what? A little stegosaurus. So the thing is, God's going to lead these animals to know. Now, what are they supposed to do when the ark lands? Reproduce, right? So is he going to lead fully grown dinosaurs far into their reproductive years? Or young, healthy dinosaurs just getting ready to enter their reproductive age? See, I would argue that he didn't lead babies to know it, but they would have been adolescents, you know, about the time when the ark landed, they would have been ready to be able to, to start to reproduce, to repopulate the world. This is not hard. Were the dinosaurs on the ark? Absolutely. What's the ark a type of? What does it represent? Salvation. In those days, there was one means of escape. You need to be on board that boat. God provided for them in those days, an ark of salvation it was an ark of wood. God provides for us today a means of salvation. Our ark is Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Folks, like we say, ain't no giraffe going to stick out the top of that boat. But why was the boat necessary? Why was the ark necessary? What was about to happen? The flood. Well, Christian, there, you know, you go with this flood stuff again. I don't know about that flood because we've actually done all this modeling and stuff. There's no way that you see, you know, your Bible says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. There's no way the atmosphere could hold enough water to cause the earth to be totally flooded. What's our response to that? We agree. Where'd the water come from? Fountains of the Great Deep. Now, I'm not disputing it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but I would argue the most likely scenario is that rain was as the result of this. 
I'm going to give you the simple sort of basic model. And remember, there are a lot of nuances, a lot of variations, depending on which geologist you talk to, because we're, we're modeling the past, so there's not 100% consensus, but I'm going to sort of give you the simple model. If you take the surface of the earth today and you smooth it down like a ping pong ball or a billiard ball, there's enough water to cover the surface of the earth for a depth of roughly two miles. Can you drown in two miles of water? Without trying, easy to do, no problem. Now, we would argue that in the pre-flood world, there was one land mass. The Bible says all the water was gathered together in one place, so I have no problem with a single land mass in the pre-flood world. Now, the fun part of that is there's a lot of debate among uh, you know, creation geologists about the shape of that land mass because you can make a case for a round, you can make a case for more like a horseshoe land mass based on the mountain building, the sedimentation patterns on the continents. It's really kind of fun. But, you know, you've seen these models where they take all the continents and they kind of computer model them and stick them back together. It looks like there's only one way to do that. Actually, there are a couple of ways to do that. But one of my favorite things is to have lunch with some of the geology guys at the ministry. And right about the time I have to leave, I go, you know, I read an interesting paper the other day about where the pre- and post-flood sedimentation boundary was. Well, guys, I got to go. And you leave. And you come back three hours later, and you're still fighting about it. It's like putting five cats in a sack. It's the most fun you can have because I could, frankly, care less where that boundary is. But they've all got their opinions, and they're going, and I'm just, I'm just having more fun. But see, the thing is, there's a lot of nuances. So let, let's just say there's a land mass, pre-flood world. The great fountains of the deep break open. So you got all this water coming up. You got these erosion surfaces. You got a lot of particulate matter in the air. It's going to be a lot of volcanic activity because as, as these plates start moving, all this magma is going to be a lot of, uh, uh, of heating of the water, things like that. So you got all this water coming out, and all of a sudden you got these plates that get pushed apart. Well, these plates that start moving, sometimes they're going to bang together, right? You're going to have subduction layers. You're going to have mountain building. I can account for the surface of the earth basically with what we call a catastrophic plate tectonic model. And again, there are a lot of different variations, but that's the basic model. And is there really any reason to believe that that's true? Because after all, uh, those rock layers are millions of years old, right? It takes millions of years to cause those rock layers. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons. Canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. and vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade. Similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. 
Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. See, the world says a whole lot of time and a little bit of water cause those rock layers. And I'm going to say, no, I think a whole lot of water and a little bit of time. I mean, look at this canyon wall. It obviously took millions of years, right? You know how long it took? A little over five and a half hours. Those layers laid down in about 30 minutes. I mean, the catastrophic plate tectonics model works very nicely. I mean, there are any number of inconsistencies with this, what's called uniformitarian model, in other words, slow processes over a long period of time. I mean, you go to the Grand Canyon, and there are places where you have like an 80-foot thick, you know, uh, section of, of sediment. It's supposed to be something like 450 million years worth of sediment. It goes down, and it makes an S-curve. Now, has anybody here tried to bend a rock lately? How'd that work out for you? Didn't work at all. You know, you can bend sedimentary rock, but you have to heat it. When you heat it, it changes the actual chemical characteristics of the rock. This rock has not been heated. It's obviously been bent while it's soft. Does rock stay soft for 450 million years? You know, if you go up on uh, uh, slopes of Mount Everest, uh, you know what you find if you dig down in the ground? You find fossils. What kind of fossils? Marine fossils. Now, Mount Everest is, what, 29,000 feet high? And that's more than two miles. If we don't have enough water. We can't account for enough water to cover the earth to the depth, you know, to cover Mount Everest. So how can we talk about the flood being a global cataclysmic flood that covered everything? Well, simply, we would argue that Mount Everest wasn't there in the pre-flood world, that the topography was more moderate, but you're going to have a lot of mountain building due to the tectonic activity and the plates moving. You're going to have all these creatures buried in sediment suddenly, and these plates bang together, and these mountains get pushed up. Now, when mountains get pushed up, what does it take with them? The sediment on the surface, right? I was going down the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago with a geologist. He was sort of pointing out to me all the rock layers, how they were millions of years old, and my Bible couldn't be true, and the obvious this and obvious that. And I said, okay, that's fine, but, uh, you know, how do you account for the marine fossils on the slopes of Mount Everest? And I thought his answer was very, very insightful. He said, Tommy, well, it looks like at one time it was underwater. <laughs> and I said, you think? <laughs> what else does the flood help us understand? Beings of dead things, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. It helps us understand the fossils. We would argue that the vast majority of what we call the fossil record is on the basis of the flood. Not all of it, but the vast majority of it. Certainly there are places around the world where you can point out post-flood catastrophism, post-flood fossilization, but the vast majority of the creatures have been trapped in the sediment from the flood. Now, when I was in high school, my sophomore biology teacher told me how fossils occur. He so said, this is what happens. Tommy, a fish dies. It sinks to the bottom. It slowly gets covered by sediment. It becomes a fossil. Is that the way it works? Actually, it's not. I remember thinking at that time, well, how do you get like a woolly mammoth fossil? It has a heart attack and falls over. How long does it take that thing to slowly get covered by sediment? You see, it just doesn't work. Anybody here have an aquarium? What happens when a fish dies? What direction does it go? It goes up. Out in, in the wild, if you will, you know, it, it, it rots, it gets scavenged, it goes away. The chance of that becoming a fossil is pretty much zero. Uh, we actually did an experiment about this at my house uh, some years ago. As I mentioned this morning, uh, I have uh, a wife and three daughters, so I'm never quite sure what catastrophe will have occurred when I get home at the end of the day. The only thing I'm sure of is it's going to be my fault. But nonetheless, I came home one day and there was great wailing and crying and gnashing of teeth because Earl was dead. And I tried to conceal my total and utter joy because to me, the only good cat's a dead cat. And I just, and I, was, but wait, I was like the Grinch. I thought up a lie and I thought it up quick. I said, girls, this is what we can do. How would you like to have a fossil cat? And they went, 
How do we do that? <laughs> Daddy's got it handled, babies. I'm on your side. We put her out in the backyard and put a sign up. Scientific experiment in progress, do not touch. And I waited to have a fossil cat. Because after all, the best kind of cat is a fossil cat. <laughs> you know, you can put a hat on him, use him as a doorstop. I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. So after a couple of days, you know, it's going to take a while. I'm a scientist. I'm willing to let this process play out. Okay, on day nine, the lawn service was no longer mowing that part of my yard, and the neighbors were circulating a petition, so this wasn't going as well as I'd planned. By day 20, the girls had forgotten all about Earl. I think we'd gotten him a guinea pig or something, and Earl was just a distant memory. But at this point, I wanted a fossil cat. This was my experiment. So it's not looking very good, and we got to day 65, and I didn't have a fossil cat. Now, I, now I was right perturbed by this because I was looking forward to having a fossil cat. What happened to Earl? He rotted. He went away, just like you'd expect, right? So how does something become a fossil? Well, here's the fish having a good day. Here's his good day coming to an end. Here is a pre-fossil. Here's a fossil. How do things become fossils? They get buried rapidly. What would account for billions of things being buried rapidly? How about the flood of Noah's day? Here's a fish eating another fish. And you got two options. This fish is eating the other fish, gets choked, has a heart attack, sinks to the bottom, and slowly gets covered by sediment. Or this thing gets covered by sediment rapidly right in the middle of lunch hour. I'll let you decide which of those two is the most logical. We have specimen in the in fossil uh, collection that actually is a fossil of a creature that got trapped suddenly in the process of giving birth. The fossil record screams rapid burial. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be ready always with an answer. And the answer is the flood was a real event and the ark was not a toy boat with the giraffe sticking out the top. they say. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Thanks. Thank you, Tommy. It was awesome. So, uh, Thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you're coming back tomorrow night. And if we could have a show of hands of how many people intend on coming back tomorrow night. So we can plan a little. Hey, all right. So we can plan just a little bit better on the food. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you. And be blessed on your way home. Drive safely. Thank you.